Hello, welcome and thank you for coming tonight. My name is Dr. Leanne Howard. I'm chair of the communication department of the University of Southern Indiana. Our department, together with the College of Liberal Arts, is very pleased to bring you uh, to tonight's event featuring Marissa Kawakowski and Tim Evans, who are two reporters uh, from a team at the Indianapolis Star who broke the story about the sexual abuse of Larry Nasser, the team doctor for USA Gymnastics, and the slow response USA Gymnastics had when the allegations were revealed. Before we get started, I want to thank some folks who've helped make this event possible, uh, including Dr. Melinda Roberts, the interim dean of the liberal arts, Alexis Rickenbaugh, and Carolyn Zulo in the college dean's office, USI special events team, particularly Rhonda Woolsey, who is also one of our majors, um, John Farless and his staff in university communications, as well as Steve Baquette, Sam Preston, and then our event organizer, Dr. Jane Weatherett. Can you please give them a, a round of applause and appreciation for their efforts? So after Larry Nassar's sentencing, Angela Povolitis, the Michigan Assistant Attorney General who prosecuted Dr. Nassar, gave the Indianapolis Star direct credit for what had been accomplished in court. She said, what finally started this reckoning and ended this decades-long cycle of abuse was investigative reporting. Without the star's reporting, she said, he would still be practicing medicine, treating athletes, and abusing kids. Our first guest tonight is Mariska Kewakowski, currently an investigative reporter at USA Today. Ms. Kewakowski began her career at Michigan at, General Grant, at Grand Haven Tribune, and moved to the Indianapolis Star in 2013. Her work involves investigations of social services and welfare issues, including child abuse and neglect, poverty, elder abuse, human trafficking, domestic violence, and access to mental health services. She has earned more than 50 journalism awards, including the prestigious Lewis M. Lyon Award for Conscious and Integrity in Journalism, and the Will Rogers Humanitarian Award. Our other guest tonight is Tim Evans, as a member of the award-winning Indianapolis Star investigative reporting team, Mr. Evans has covered race and diversity issues, social services, gaming, courts and the law, children's issues, including child and sexual abuse. A recent inductee to the Indiana Journalism Hall of Fame, Mr. Evans has been the driving force behind Indy Star Call for Action, a free consumer hotline that has saved or recovered more than $1.5 million for Hoosiers. Moderating our discussion tonight is Dr. Jane Weatherid, an assistant professor of public relations and advertising in the Department of Communication. Dr. Weatherid researches sexual abuse and the media, and she's written about numerous high profile cases, including the case at USA Gymnastics. At the end of the discussion, Dr. Weatherid will open the floor for discussions. I also want to announce that this event may contain difficult, sensitive material about sexual violence, sexual assault, and abuse. I hope we can work together as a community to create an atmosphere of mutual respect and sensitivity, and I encourage you to use the resources at this event in USI's Counseling and Psychological Services Department to care for your safety and well-being. Without further ado, please welcome our panelists. Okay, uh, welcome and thank you all for coming to this event. Uh, before we start, I thought I would give a little background about this story and how it developed. I found that as I taught my students, and I realized this happened in Indianapolis, because it reached the height of national um, attention that it did, as well as global, because the Olympians involved, many students and faculty did not realize the scope. So I just want to give a little introduction about how this story developed, and then I'm going to have detailed questions for the reporters to reveal to you their journey. Uh, clearly, this story is of importance to Indiana. Both reporters, as you heard, worked on this for several years while at the Indy Star, clearly based in Indianapolis. The headquarters of USA Gymnastics is also based in Indianapolis. This investigation began with looking into complaints made by USA Gymnastics about gymnastic coaches. That's where it started, just regular coaches at regular gymnastic groups. 
This investigation eventually revealed that USA Gymnastics had a policy of not reporting all sexual abuse allegations against its coaches to any law enforcement or authorities. Later, in August of 2016, they reported a much longer story called A Blind Eye to Sexual Abuse, how USA Gymnastics failed to report the cases filed against USA Gymnastics, including a Georgia case where a coach preyed on young athletes for seven years. This article was read by Rachel Den Hollander, who contacted the Indy Star reporters to tell them that while she was not abused by a coach, she was abused by a doctor named Larry Nasser while a gymnast at a local gym in Michigan at the time. This led many other gymnasts naming Nasser as their abuser as well, and he was eventually arrested, tried, convicted, and sentenced it to more than 120 years in prison. Finally, just last year, in December of 2021, after five years in court, the Nasser abuse survivors reached a $380 million settlement with USA Gymnastics and the USA Olympic and Paralympic Committee headquartered in Indianapolis. More than 500 women were Nasser's victims and will be compensated among them were gold Olympic medalists, Simone Biles, Allie Raisman, Michaela Monroney, and others. We are pleased to have you both here today to share your story with us about you uncovered this abuse scandal. My first question is for Marissa. Uh, clearly, this news story first broke with the publication of that news story that I referenced. Can you summarize what was in that article and tell us a bit about how this got started? Happy to. So this investigation really grew out of reporting that my colleagues and I had been doing into failures to report child sexual abuse in schools. There had been a number of cases in Indiana in which a school official was having an inappropriate relationship with students. Other school officials found out about it and didn't immediately report it as required by law. And as I was doing a broader piece about why does this seem to keep happening, why aren't people following this mandatory child abuse reporting law, when a source reached out and said, you really should look at USA Gymnastics and how they handle these allegations. And that source pointed me toward a lawsuit in Georgia and records that he said might soon be sealed by the judge. So with the approval of our bosses, that very same day I got the tip, I flew to Georgia and picked up almost 1,000 pages of records. And within those records was the policy that you heard Jane reference earlier about not reporting all allegations of child abuse to authorities as required by law. They said they would only report if the allegations had been signed in writing by a victim, a victim's parent, or an eyewitness to the abuse. And so the next step in our investigation was we knew what the policy was. What was the impact of that policy on the safety of children in the sport? And pretty soon after I picked up those records, Tim and then our colleague Mark Alicia joined the investigation, and we were pursuing the answer to that question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next question is really for both of you. Uh, I referenced, of course, uh, what prompted Rachel Denhollander to call you and mention Larry Nasser. This was the first time that his name came up in your investigation. Can you tell us more about what happened next after you discovered Larry Nasser? We, we had been investigating this uh, for about six months and our, until our first story came out in August of 2016. And at that time, we were looking at coaches, again, at uh, local gym clubs. It wasn't we had no idea that was at the elite level, um, and we had not, no idea of Larry Nasser at that time, and we had written our first story, and it involved, um, we, we wanted to show the damage from the policy that Marissa discovered, that somebody told USA Gymnastics about a bad coach, they let that coach continue to coaching, and then he would harm another girl, so there was actual harm from that policy. And after we published our story, uh, we had a, it was published in Indy Star, it was also published in USA Today and about 60 or 70 other papers around the country. Um, and we had a tip line set up for phone and email. And we were suddenly flooded with tips uh, after that first story came out. And among them was Rachel Denhollander, who again told us about Nasser. Within a few days, 
we had gotten at least one other or it was two other reports about Nasser. And again, we had, you know, getting all these tips. So we had all these people we had to follow up on. And obviously we saw that Nasser and had multiple tips. So we began looking more deeply at him. And same for you, Marissa. Um, you're working on Nasser once you discovered him. Yeah, so just building off of what Tim said, you know, we had a list of names on a whiteboard that was the entire length of the whiteboard. People that they said were predators who were still involved with the sport. And so we divvied up all of those names and were pursuing information about all of those individuals. And because of, first of all, who Larry Nasser was in the USA Gymnastics world and the fact that we'd gotten multiple tips relating to him, we also took a closer look in particular at his situation. And uh, Mark and I were interviewing the survivors who had contacted us while Tim was digging into the medical techniques that Larry claimed that he was performing. And um, I'll let Tim talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, um, you know, without getting too graphic, Nasser was inappropriately touching young women, uh, claiming it was a uh, a way to release tension. He was an osteopathic physician. And so I, w I went to medical experts. I went to uh, um, professors to see if there was any legitimate reason that NASA would perform those kind of techniques on a young girl. And I found out that it was th there was one instance where you might use that technique, but it would be on typically a middle-aged or elderly woman who was having incontinence issues or something like that. And there was no reason to be touching a 12-year-old girl with a backache. Uh, that way. So then we, and, and then it, indeed, if they were going to perform that um, procedure, what, what, what is the standard of practice? You know, you would wear gloves, you would have another adult in the room, you would tell both the adult and the, the child, I'm going to do this now, clearly explain what you're doing. And again, Nasser did none of those things. So we, we knew once we got that and, and the testimony from the, the survivors that there was no excuse and what he was doing was not a legitimate medical practice. And I do just want to add, for those of you who may not have been familiar with his name, at the time that we started our investigation, Larry Nasser was still a professor at Michigan State University. He was running for local school board, he was working at a local gymnastics club as a doctor, he was still seeing patients. And so, you know, because of that, and, and honestly, the way that we work with any investigation, we are being very careful to pursue all of those avenues and, and make sure that we understand the scope of what's going on. Because obviously, you know, without knowing all of those details, there was a lot at stake. There was not only everything that the survivors had been through, but at this point, you know, we didn't want to accuse someone falsely. And, and so we were very diligent all of us about digging through all the information that we received and verifying it and showing the ways in which what he was doing deviated from the way that it should have been done if he was doing a legitimate medical procedure. And, and real quickly, he was the team doctor for USA Gymnastics, probably three or four Olympics. Uh, if you remember the Carrie Shrug when she does the vault and hobbles off and Bella Caroli picks her up, uh, you know, to win the gold medal. Larry Nasser's the guy in the picture that's helping helping bring her in he was revered his his office at michigan state was pictures of all the great you know mary lou Rett and all these great gymnasts so these young women you know thought they were going to the best all the, all the olympians went to dr nasser so to some of them it was a privilege to be able to be treated by him and so you know again there was this high image and uh, you know a lot of the victims were showing so young they didn't really know they were being molested. They thought they were going through something that was uncomfortable. But gosh, you know, he treated all these other Olympians. He must be the best. Yeah, probably uh, jumping off of that question, because you mentioned some of these challenges, what was the most challenging aspect of this investigation? I think really two main challenges come to mind. I, I think the first is that our investigation was always focused on the systemic failures by USA Gymnastics. It was bigger than just Larry Nasser. And USA Gymnastics wouldn't talk to us. They denied our interview requests. They would only answer questions in writing. And even then, they wouldn't fully answer questions um, or give us partial answers. 
And so we wanted to be fair and we wanted to present the information to the public so that they understood everything that was going on and that was difficult when USA Gymnastics wouldn't communicate with us. I think one of the other major challenges was that there was so much that people came to us with and that we wanted to be able to pursue all of it, but we couldn't. And so we had to make decisions about what information to prioritize in terms of you know, people who are still involved with the sport or, or things that were most important for the public safety perspective as we were doing our investigation. Yeah, and then like Marissa said, everybody's story and every, everybody's trauma was important to them. And there were three of us, reporters, Marissa, myself, and Mark Alicia. And, you know, there's only so many bodies and so much to go around. And so we had to look for impact, people who are still active, uh, maybe not somebody who molested children back in the 90s, although we looked at it and we, we tried to offer them help and direction. The, the other challenge, and it was more, um, was the approach we took to dealing with the survivors. And you'll notice, unless we mess up, we always call these uh, people survivors. We, we don't use the victim term. Um, so obviously, the, we're strangers. They've reached out to us. We're suddenly calling them back. Some strange guy calls you on the phone and says, tell me about the worst thing that ever happened to you in your life, you know. And we had a kind of a mantra from the start, you know, we weren't going to do any more harm, you know. Our goal was not to create add to people's trauma. And so, you know, we, we went, and we had the luxury of time, but we went very slowly with the people that we, we interviewed. And, you know, sometimes they, they'd really be charged up at first, and then you start talking, and, you know, they break down. And so, you know, we'd let them know, you're in control. You're driving this interview. If you're uncomfortable, let's stop it. You know, we, we can take a break. Uh, we can take a few days, whatever. You know, again, and there were a lot of people who talked to us but weren't ready to be named or have their story that was told publicly. And one of the things we told a lot of the survivors is, you know, do you understand what talking to us means to you? You know, and it, it helps us get a great story, sure. But your trauma, your story is going to be on the Internet for the rest of your life, for the rest of our lives. And are, are you ready for that? And really work with them to make sure they understood what working with us entailed to them in the long, in the, the big picture. And there were people who weren't ready, and, um, but, but them speaking to us was helpful because it helped us understand that we didn't have one or two people. There wasn't one or two bad apples. This was a problem across the sport. It was deeply rooted. And they, what the knowledge they gave us helped us know that we were on the right track. Um, but again, you know, we, we went above and beyond anything you know, line of where, here's your, what you're supposed to do ethically as a journalist. You know, we went twice that high to make sure um, that people understood, they were comfortable with what we were going to say. So that, that was a challenge, not as, as a challenge like hunting down, you know, the, 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 the needle in the haystack, but it was a challenge for the way we approached interviews and working with the survivors. And um, while it, it made things more difficult than a normal, you might normally deal with in journalism. It also opened the door to other people. People would say, they'd tell somebody else they knew in the system, hey, these people are treating you right. They're going to listen to you. They're not going to, you know, use you, exploit you for a good headline. They're really sincere about it. And the, gymnastics is a very closed network. Uh, USA Gymnastics controls the path to the Olympics, you know. You've got thousands of young girls down in the gyms. You've got six or seven that go to the Olympics. You've got to go through that gate, and that gate was shut because everybody was afraid of what the future was. And and we we kind of put a hole in that dam. And you know, the more people we talked, the more people we treated well, the trickle of the water grew and grew, and we started getting people to reach out to us. I think you already addressed my question, which was about getting sur those survivors to go on the record, but that's fine. Uh, one of my other questions, of course, was. What was the toughest detail to pin down or fact to confirm? Because you said the investigation was larger, right? So it became, and I have heard a couple brief anecdotes about this from both of you, about some of the things that you were trying to get people to say or confirm uh, as part of your story when it came to that broader context, as well as there was one about Larry Nasser. 
Yeah, I, I think I would mention two things. Uh, as as Tim was saying, um, you know, when we first started this investigation, I mentioned that we wanted to see the impact of that policy on the safety of kids. And we were very specifically looking for coaches and individuals that we knew USA Gymnastics had been warned about, but did not stop from working with children in member gyms. And that those individuals who went on to abuse more people. So we were specifically looking for those and, and gathering records and trying to verify information to confirm that and to show the public the harm of that policy. I, I think that was certainly challenging as we were doing that work. I, I think the other thing I would say is more broadly, trauma is complicated. And there were a lot of details of what people shared with us that you just can't confirm. You know, there may have just been two people in the room. And, and so we spent a lot of time because we wanted to make sure that we were being accurate and sharing good information with the public to verify all the details that we could. So maybe it would be verifying that both individuals were at the competition that they said it had happened at, as an example, or verifying that someone was Larry Nasser's patient through medical records. And so we did a lot of due diligence to verify information and make sure that we were presenting the public with accurate information and helping them understand what was going on. Yeah, and then I have one for Tim. We first connected back in 2016 about this story and spoke on the phone. I remember you telling me specifically how Nasser was perceived by the parents of survivors and the community even after the allegations came out. Can you share a bit about this? Sure. Can I tell them about our first experience? Uh, that's fine. <laughs> Distinguished Dr. Weatherit here <laughs> reached out to me uh, by email. I think I responded and called her, and we were talking on the phone, and all of a sudden she goes, ooh, ooh, there's a bee in my car. <laughs> And so we had to interrupt our conversation uh, so she could swat the bee out of her car. I think she was in the line to pick up her daughter from school or something. So um, she made a memorable impression on me, obviously. So, you know, I, I talked to a lot of people. So, um, yeah, Nasser, you know, me and I, I hit on this a little bit. You know, Nasser was, and, and we all, as a society, you know, there's a deference. Uh, we revere doctors. We respect them, you know, and, and Nasser... Again, he had this office full of all these pictures of the famous gymnast. He was at the Olympics. He was at all the national events. And again, he was trusted. And and, and you know, we we looked, and there were there were no mal, you know the normal stuff a reporter does. Are there any malpractice complaints? Are there any lawsuits? Are there any you know professional complaints? And there was nothing like that for him. Uh, and later, we found out that he'd been reported twice, but. The investigations didn't go anywhere, so there was no public paper trail, the kind of thing that reporters look for and love. Um, and he was running for school board in his local community, and he, he'd, start, he'd started a foundation to help autistic children. And he, was, he was this godlike creature in, in gymnastics. And, you know, um, gymnastics has take, in, in the U.S. with the Crowleys kind of took this Eastern European approach, um, very uh, hard. You know, you drive, you start, the girls are very young. And it's very harsh. And Nasser was the good guy. He was the guy at the Crowley Ranch in Texas that would sneak them M&Ms or candy. You know, he'd help them out on an up day, you know, where, where their coaches are weighing them and, you know, fat shaming them and, you know, berating them to make, you know, in this mindset that this kind of mean approach makes them better. And so Nasser was the good guy and, and you know, the guy who molested 500 plus young girls was seen in that scene as the good guy and that shows how upside down the world of gymnastics high level gymnastics is so you know that's how he kind of ingratiated himself into, into the system and then a follow-up question about that you were the first and only reporter to interview Larry Nasser. can you tell us more about that interview yeah um, like Marissa said we, we had a whiteboard and we, we had this kind of war room where we worked and we all divvied up, you know, and, and Mark, Alicia went down and met with Rachel Denhollander, who was kind of the, the leader of, of the people who um, uh, were coming out of, of, about Nasser, and she was very critical to the story. Marissa had gone to California to meet with another uh, former Olympian who was a Jane Doe at that time. She's come forward since and made her name public. And I just had a heart attack not long before this and almost died. And 
I wasn't really into traveling if I could. So um, one of my jobs was, to, to, as I said, to talk to the medical experts. The second part of my job was kind of a throwaway, you know, is, is um, Evans. Reach out to Nasser's, uh, Nasser and his attorney and get the no comment because these people never want to, you know, comment. So, you know, it was an, that was an afterthought. So I sent an email to Nasser's uh, work e email, and I found in some other documents his personal email. And I, so, you know, sent out emails on a Wednesday night. So, you know, I'll wait for the no comment response. Well, I got in the next morning, and my, there were two emails from Nasser in my inbox. One had come about 7.30 in the morning, and the other was about 8.30 in the morning. The first one said, oh, I'm so sorry that these girls have misunderstood me. All I was trying to do was help them. I, this is a misunderstanding. I really would like you to come up and meet with me, and I'll, I'll explain to you what's going on. The second email that had come about a half hour later says, I've talked to my wife, and it might be better if you meet me with my attorney. So I went, sent him an email back, said, please send me your attorney's contact information. And again, I was in, in Indianapolis. His attorney was in Grand Rapids, Michigan, so I reached out, and his attorney called me and says, what's going on? I don't know what you're talking about. And I said, you know, will you talk to me? He said, I think Dr. Nasser wants to talk. I don't normally let my clients talk, but in this case, I think I would. So I said, I can be there in four hours. And he said, well, you know, and this was Thursday. He said, I've got something going on. I said, how about tomorrow? No, I thought that was Friday. I said, how about Saturday or Sunday? I can, I can you know, I'll come to you as fast as we can get there because I didn't want him to let him off the hook and he said okay Monday morning at 10 a.m. so I got up about 5 a.m. and that Monday morning and drove to Grand Rapids uh, to meet Larry Nasser and his attorney um, the interview was kind of a dud um, <laughs> because well I, I got there to the office and, and Nasser had um, all of these magazine with articles about him and newspaper clippings and some of these videos, and if you've watched Athlete A, you'll see some of the clips of some of those videos of him working on the young girls. And he wanted, you know, he wanted to kind of wow me with his all these articles and things. And he showed me, started showing me a couple of the videos on his laptop, and it was, you know, massaging girls, and the, you, you couldn't see their face or anything, but it was a young girl on her stomach, in in kind of briefs, and he's kind of massaging her buttocks and down between her legs, you know, not penetrating her or anything, but you know, saying, you, you can understand why they might misunderstand what I'm doing. If you, you see this, you, maybe that'll help you understand. And um, I asked him, and, and Nasser a, was a quirky guy, you know, and if you look at him, he, he, was, he was kind of nerdy, you know, whatever. I'm one to talk, I'm sorry. But uh, anyhow, when he was when he was talking to me and, and leading that discussion, he was very confident. You know, he, he, was, he was the expert in charge. And, again, if you saw Athlete A, you saw that difference when he was talking to the detective, Andrea Mumford, in the questioning. And then when she started putting on him, you know, he, he'd start blinking and, you know, his, his body language would change. And so, you know, I asked him, why don't you wear gloves? And he, 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 he kind of stutters. You know, I, I, it, it impedes my ability to really, really feel that uh, it was a muscle or a tendon that he claimed that was what he was trying to, myofascial release, I believe was the term. Um, so as I'm sitting there, we knew that there was a, a lawsuit coming in California against Nasser that would kind of give us the, the public record. You know, in, in, in journalism, it, when you're making an accusation against somebody, it's, you've got to be pretty serious, especially somebody in Nasser's position. And, you know, we, we call it paper. You know, we, we wanted some paper on him, you know, a police report, a lawsuit. So this, we had a story getting ready. We knew this lawsuit was going to come. And so I'm sitting there, and as he's doing this, and I get a text from Marissa, and she says, the lawsuit's filed. And so as a journalist, I probably wasn't ethically required to do this, but I said, hey, I've just got a text. There, there's been a lawsuit filed against Dr. Nasser in California. And his attorney said, is there any chance we could get a copy of it? So I reached back out to Marissa and he, you either emailed it to me or to, uh, to the, the attorney. So Nasser and his attorney went back into the office, read the lawsuit, came back out. Again, it was a Jane Doe, the, the person, but there were initials, and there were enough which, which Olympic team she was on, which gold medal team she was on. And he came back and started, you know, drilling me. Who is it? Who is it? I know it's, I know it's Jamie. And, and, and I said, you know, I, I don't know. I haven't spoken to her. This is a, one of my colleagues has done this. So... His attorney said, well, because of this lawsuit, we can't speak anymore. But he, he will see, I will say one thing, and that's uh, kind of to paraphrase. He said, 
Dr. Nasser denies that he ever penetrated a, a, any patient, any young girl. Um, and from that, we published that in our story, for our story about Nasser the next day. And that's kind of started this flood of people saying BS. You know, he did it to me, he did it to me, he did it to me. And, you know, his, his attorney, had he not said that, maybe they could have wiggled out of it. But, you know, that, that just, you know, angered people. It gave them something, you know, that, that was a hard point. You know, it, you either did or you didn't. And so that, that was, and, you know, again, I drove up there four hours. I had about 15 minutes with him. Uh, and then his attorney shut him up. And, again, you know, selfishly, if I was just looking for a good story or a good headline, I would have let him keep talking and not told him that, about the lawsuit. But, again, we tried to go above and beyond everything we did in this. And, you know, this, this is the world in the time when fake news was becoming the just coming out and you know journalism is under attack and we always took the high road even though it meant maybe we didn't get as flashy headlines but we were on target and on track uh we never had to retract anything like that so i'm sorry for rambling no i just want to right. add one thing because it was incredibly important that statement that the attorney gave to tim was incredibly, incredibly important because for many survivors, it was the first time that they realized they were survivors. Because some of them, even up until we published, had still believed that what they had experienced while uncomfortable had been a legitimate medical procedure. And when they saw that statement that he had never used penetration in the course of medical treatment, they knew that was a lie. And it made them start to question what had happened. And so that brought many, many people coming forward to all of us after that article came out. Yeah, so then my next question is, what would you say has been the most satisfying result of your reporting? I mean, there's been so many, so uh, I'm curious to hear what you think out of all of them uh, was the most satisfying as far as results. You know, I'll probably get emotional doing this, so I'm sorry, but I had a, my, my, my wife back there with the blue hair um, is a Starbucks addict, and we go to, Star, I go to Starbucks a lot, and um, we were in the drive-thru one day, and a, a guy who knew both of us was in the drive-thru, and Jennifer gets her coffee, and he goes, hey, congratulations, Tim, you got Nasser, and I was like, I don't know, you know, I didn't, I didn't feel like congratulations was the right word, you know, and other people have said that, and, and I think what we did is we, we gave voice to a bunch of people who had, some of them who had tried to speak out and didn't, or, or that people didn't believe them, and, you know, that, knowing that some old fat stranger in Indianapolis was able to help them and stop this monster, you know, you, there can't be anything more rewarding than that, and, and you know, I was in Washington, D.C. at a Senate hearing, and all these young ladies, you know, came up, and there were a bunch of survivors there, and, you know, I'm hanging around their attorney and a couple of the officials, and they're going, you know, who's that guy, who's that guy? And they said, oh, he's Tim Evans, you know, and suddenly all these girls come up to me and say, oh, you're my hero, you know, and it's like, I'm not, I'm not, not a hero in this, you know, they're the heroes of people that trusted us, that trusted their stories, and, you know, gave them a voice. And, you know, we, we got lots of awards. We got a lot of recognition. We're, you know, talking to you about this five years later. You know, there, there's a lot of professional satisfaction or, you know, recognition. But the fact, you know, to, to know that people feel that way about our work, you know, you couldn't ask for any better, you know, result than that. Marissa? I think, similar to Tim, for me, what was most rewarding was amplifying the voices of people who needed to be heard. And, um, you know, they had voices and, and they were using them and, and we were able to help amplify them and help the public understand what was going on. I, I think that was incredibly rewarding. And then, in terms of, you know, the hope was that 
this wrong, this failure that we saw would be changed. And, and are we there yet? No, but there's a new federal law that came out of our reporting that requires all national governing bodies to immediately report child sexual abuse allegations to authorities. And so that's not just USA Gymnastics, that's USA Swimming, that's Taekwondo, diving, um, in the hope that, that not only did we share voices that needed to be heard, but also that we could prevent it from happening to some other people. And um, that's the hope, that we leave, our work leaves people in, in a better place um, through the reporting that we've done. Can I add one more thing? I'm sorry. Oh, sure. But but after that, there was a groundswell in, in, in gymnastics and sports around the world of amateur sports that people, and not because of what we did, but what, what happened, they felt empowered. And, you know, they, they, there, were, there were organizations that were cleaned up. Again, we're not there, and, and it, it's something that will never go away because people who want to do bad things to kids are going to go to gravitate to where they have access to kids. But there was an attention to it, and, and it's, it's getting better. And at least for a little while, you know, there, that attention made it more believable. The, the, the horrible thing about abuse and, and being abused is so many people don't believe. And, you know, this made it, it is possible, it is real. And, you know, maybe it, maybe I can say something now and people will believe me because what, what, what could be worse than to be a survivor and to say something and not be believed? I mean, that's just, just I, I can't fathom it, but, I, you know, it's got to be worse than anything, so. Yeah, and, and sort of touching on the systemic problem in institutions, not just USA Gymnastics, but I had a question about, you know, what went wrong, not only really in USA Gymnastics, but Penn State, the Catholic Church, the Boy Scouts, that enabled this to happen for so many years, and maybe to that point, what needs to change? I realize you now have that law, which is great, but it almost seems like it keeps happening. As Tim mentioned earlier, sexual abuse is a pervasive community issue. It's not exclusive to gymnastics, or the Catholic Church, or Boy Scouts, or any other institution. And so what we look at journalistically and, and what the public needs to understand it is not to say there will never be sexual abuse again. We would love for that to be true, but the reality is that that's probably never going to happen. The question is, what do institutions do when they find out? There is a clear, there are guidelines, there are recommendations, there are laws that say what institutions should do to ensure that this does not continue to happen, both to the individual that it happened to and to future individuals. And so journalistically what we're looking at is not necessarily, oh, it's a bad place because they had an allegation of sexual abuse. It's no, what did that institution do to protect the people in their program when those allegations came to light? And, and most often what those organizations do, they circle the wagons, they lawyer up, and they try to protect their image, they try to, try to protect their source of income, instead of doing the right thing and protecting their survivors and making the story go away. If they would have stepped up and said, gosh, we didn't realize we had this problem, we're going to fix it, we're going to do the right thing, people like us will go away and go find somebody else to bother. But when they start lying to you, and you know they're lying, and they're covering up, and the only reason they're covering up is to save their million dollar salaries or their sponsorship you know and that's what drives a lot of this why the institutions don't do the right thing because of money and power and, and control yeah and I have just a few more questions but one of them is very broad as well uh, particularly for students who might be considering investigative journalism today uh, but what is the role of investigative journalism in our democracy uh, particularly today, you addressed uh, fake news and some changes we've had, and yet your investigations certainly seem to have some results, right? So what's the importance of investigative journalism? Tim has a really good answer. I'm going to let him answer. And I, I, I don't know what they're talking about. So anyhow, <laughs> I think it's, it's more important than ever, and, and you know, there are a million sources of information and, and noise out there. Where you, can, you can find news anywhere. But again, we, we are the, and a lot of people don't like the media. We're liberal or we're something or we're something or we're something. But we come at it from being, you know, you're the, the conscience of the public. We, we're the, the 
try to be the, the voice of the people without voice. We try to represent people who don't have anybody else representing them. And, you know, as the media landscape changes, there are fewer and fewer of us doing that. that um, the bottom line is we're fighting for people who are underserved, who don't have a voice or who are being silenced. And, you know, I think it's more important than ever. And again, it's hard to distinguish sometimes what, what the media is. The media is everything, Facebook, TikTok, you know, all the way across there. But we're journalism, and there, there's a difference in that, and, and we haven't done as a profession, haven't done a good enough job distinguishing ourselves from that, those others. But we really are, you know, and, you know, trying to be the voice and the eyes and the ears and the conscience of the public. And I know I probably didn't answer it right, but. It is the right answer. Um, no, I, I agree. I think, you know, what Tim and I do and what our colleagues in investigative journalism do is really exposing wrongdoing and holding officials accountable. Um, our job is not to be advocates. There are people who advocate outside of the work or because of the work that we've done, but our job is really just to shed light and bring these problems into the daylight. And I, I think when we talk about media literacy and kind of the role of democracy, part of the work that we need to do is to make sure that we help the public understand that, you know, media is a very broad term. There are people who are paid to have opinions and those are very valid jobs that add value to society, but that's not what we do. Our job as journalists is to be fair and accurate and to help the public understand what's going on in their communities, whether it's their local communities, throughout the United States or internationally. And I just add, because I can't shut up, um, <laughs> is, you know, that we take that challenge of accuracy and fairness to the nth degree. And, you know, the, the three of us who were the main reporters, Marissa and Mark and myself, when we finished our story, after we had editors go over it with a fine tooth comb and challenge us on stuff, we sat in this conference room, we projected this, this story up onto a big screen TV. We all had, uh, you know, computer printouts of our story. And we went through it literally word by word and challenging someone who's, who's, who had this information about the, what the doctor should do. That's me. The other two would say, prove it. And so we'd prove it. We got down to the point where we had we designated an official dictionary. So we would look up, is many all right? Or should we say some? Or can we say a few? We got down to those little points. And I think a lot of people don't realize the importance of that. And, and that's different than people who have opinions and, you know, shout on TV. We went down to every last word. And once we were all three convinced we were good with it, we put a black highlighter on it. We went to the next word or the next sentence. And it would take us two days to get through a story sometimes. And we'd have, you know... Marissa and Mark are, were, are younger and uh, more computer savvy. I'd have a big stack of papers like this. I'd be rooting through them like an old man. And, you know, they'd call up on the computer and show me their screen. But we did that, and we took it so seriously. And, and one of the reasons is because if you make one mistake in a story like that, and even if it's an innocuous mistake and you have the wrong year or you have the wrong name, you know, and it doesn't affect the big point of the story, Suddenly you can be attacked. Look, they can't even get the year right. They can't even get my name right. How can I believe anything else in that story? So, you know, I, I don't think people understand that. The, and, you know, you can't do it sometimes when you're a reporter working on covering a meeting and coming back and filing a story in two hours. But on a project like this, we went to the extreme to make sure, you know, literally every T crossed, every I dotted, every fact checked, rechecked, and rechecked. Okay, so I'm going to move on to sort of what you've been working on in the future. And uh, Marissa, you may have to correct me here. I do know that at some point you were covering Jerry Harris and the cheer sexual allegations and his arrest. And I also watched cheer season two and saw where they interviewed you in episode five. Can you fill us in on that new story and or anything else you've been working on? So... My colleague at USA Today, Trisha Nadolny, and I had been working on an investigation into misconduct and cheerleading. While we were talking about right institutions and sexual abuse being a pervasive issue, we found a lot of those same problems in the sport of cheerleading. And as part of that broader investigation into misconduct and cheerleading and the ways in which 
the entities that oversee that sport were failing to protect athletes who were involved in the program. We learned of allegations against an individual named Jerry Harris. Now, for those of you who have seen the show Cheer on Netflix, that will, name will be familiar to you. If you haven't seen it, maybe you saw him uh, on the red carpet or you saw him you know, appear on a talk show. Um, through the first season of Cheer, he became a very well-known figure. And we received allegations of inappropriate conduct by Jerry Harris to uh, underage male athletes involved in the sport. And two of those athletes shared those allegations with us. At the time that we interviewed those boys, Jerry Harris, again, had not been arrested, had not been charged. He was still working in cheer camps. He was still involved. He was this iconic figure. And they had text messages. They'd reported it to law enforcement. They'd reported it to the governing bodies for the sport of cheer. And no action had been taken. And they were incredibly frustrated by the lack of action, which is what prompted them to reach out to us. And so I flew to Texas, and I interviewed the family. We reported our story. And it was right around that same time that the FBI got involved. And they ended up uh, executing a search warrant at his home. He ended up being criminally charged. Earlier this year, he's pleaded guilty, and he'll be sentenced this summer relating to those allegations of what he did, not just to the boys that I interviewed, but to other boys as well in a pattern of behavior. Yeah, thank you. I think that was February 10th that he uh, pled guilty, right? It was earlier this month, yes. Yeah, earlier just this month. And then Tim, sort of the same uh, point, but I, I see that you were inducted into the Indiana Journalism Hall of Fame in 2020. Congratulations. Uh, can you also fill us in on what you're working on now? Since, since gymnastics, uh, we kind of finished that up in 2019, although we still do a little bit on it. Um, in, in 2019, before COVID hit, I was working with two other partners at the Star. And we were looking at nursing home care in Indiana. Indiana has some of the worst nursing homes in the country, unfortunately. And found out that 92% of the nursing homes in Indiana are owned by county hospitals because they get, because of that ownership, they get extra money. Uh, so if, if you get $200 a day if you're a private nursing home to care for a person, you get $300 a day if you're a county hospital. But the hospitals were not putting that money in the nursing homes. They were siphoning it off to, for other things. And... We published our first story right before COVID hit, and then suddenly COVID hit, and this then the issue became even more more problematic because our nursing homes were some of the lowest staffed in America in Indiana, and suddenly COVID hit, and they weren't prepared, and, and then we had a surge of nursing home deaths, and we had a they were dying at a higher rate in Indiana nursing homes than in most any other state. So that was one project. Then I, I came out of that, and, and you know I, I have a happy job. I went into a project on people dying in county jails across Indiana. And uh, I'll mention your, your county sheriff down here in uh, Vandenberg County was very open to us and very helpful. And we were looking and, and you know, people, somebody dies in a county jail in Indiana every two weeks for the last 10 years. Um, more than half of them are suicides. And the problem is not necessarily, you know, when we, when we first started, we thought this is a problem with the sheriffs. But then we started talking to the sheriffs, and they're dealing with, they're, they're a dump, county jails are a dumping ground for people with mental illness and people with drug, abuse, drug addiction. And they don't have the resources to treat those people. And so they do what they can, they cycle back in and back out. And that's the problem in Indiana jails. People are dying every two weeks. Somebody's dying somewhere. Most of them have a mental illness that needs some sort of treatment. The state does not have adequate treatment system for them. There's not enough drug addiction uh, services, particularly in rural areas. And again, you know, when I started out, you, you kind of have an idea, but you, you, you can't be locked on a point. And you thought, again, oh, the sheriffs are doing something and they're not doing something. This is a systemic problem that comes with the state legislature and the governor is where it really lands. And the sheriffs are the folks that are stuck with the problem, trying the best they can do. And again, your sheriff down here is very candid and uh, opened up his jail to us and, and really helped open our eyes. And so that was my last one, and we just published those stories at the end of 2021. 
Again, thank you. And thank you both so very much for coming to USI to share your experiences with us. Uh, now we have time for questions from the audience. There is a microphone in the middle of the room. Uh, for those of you, it was easier instead of passing one around in these times, uh, can come up to the microphone to uh, pose a question to our speakers. First off, thank you both for coming here and sharing your stories with us. We really appreciate it. Indianapolis has kind of a thing for institutions, especially institutions involving amateur sports and, frankly, youth involvement in the NCAA, USA Gymnastics, a whole bunch of Olympic sports, but also a whole lot of Greek life organizations and, frankly, a whole lot of institutions that are ripe for the investigative journalism, to be quite frank. And the Indy Star, being the newspaper of record for Indianapolis, is right on the doorstep to do that. How do you balance the responsibility you have to the community of Indianapolis to put resources into investigating issues that matter more locally versus having all of these institutions, as you've talked about, that need to be held accountable and at least from proximity, you're the best people to do it because you're the closest. You know, it's a real challenge, and you know, there, there are three of us, and you know, it, it's and we're every day somebody's calling me, and it's a legitimate story, and it's the same same as with the gymnastics. You know, you you can't take them all, and so you try to look at okay, what what can we do where we feel like we have a chance to make a difference that makes a difference to the, the most folks we can, you know, it's kind of a, you hate to put it this way, but it's a cost-benefit analysis kind of, you know, what, what, and what our editor would say, okay, what, what's the worst story we could get out of this? You know, what's the, what's the least we could do? What's our best? And we, and again, and it's the thing that haunts me at night, you know, I know I, there are dozens of stories that I would like to do. I know that there are trouble, but, you know, there's only so many of us and, you know, we can't, you know, you, you, there's some need to mix it up for readers, too. You know, they don't want to, you know, th there was a fatigue in the gymnastics stuff after a while. People, I'm tired. We get it. Gymnastics bad. Nass are bad. Move on. And, um, you know, so it, it's hard. Um, subscribe to your local newspaper. Again, this USA Gymnastics thing that became an international story started with Marissa checking on a situations at a local school in Indianapolis. It was a local story. She kept digging, and, you know, I, I say it's kind of like fishing. You throw your line out, you know, and we, we were in the local pond, and suddenly the big fish got on there, and you just kept pulling that string, and you never know what's on there. But, again, it doesn't have to be the New York Times. It doesn't have to be the Wall Street Journal or the Washington Post. You know, and then the year that our stuff published, the Pulitzer Prize winner, was, a, was it a weekly paper in West Virginia who did an opioid crisis? Again, you know, but... And I'm not begging you for money or anything, but it costs money. And, and the, the amount of money they spend on us is, is unbelievable. They, they cut spending on other parts of the, news, of the newspaper while we were doing this project. And, and this is a day and age when newspapers are you know, struggling to keep their head above water. So, you know, you might think it's not worth it. I'm not going to pay a buck or seven bucks to get an online subscription. But you're paying for cable television. You know, we're paying five bucks a day at Starbucks. You know, you, your work, and, you know, I, I feel like an evangelist, kind of, I'll get off my soapbox, but, you know, you can do it, and there are people at newspapers across the country, there are people in Evansville that could do it if they had the time, if they had the resources, and if they had the subscribers to help cover it. So, the other thing is, and I've talked to a lot of people, don't give up on me. If you call me today, and I tell you I can't do it now, don't forget about me. Call me, call me in a month. Bug me, you know. Don't bug me every day because I got some work to do. But put that bug back in my ear. Remind me, hey, Tim, you know, I talked to you about this. And, you know, again, because I'm like a kid at a, kid at a buffet, you know, a little, a little kid with big eyes and a plate full of stuff. And I want to put that next big scoop on my plate, too. But, I, you know, at some point, realist, I have to look realistic and say, I can only eat so much. And so it, it's, it's, a, it's a conundrum. I don't know what to do about it. But... Don't give up and, don't, and support your local newspaper. I just want to add to that yes to everything that Tim just said. Um, 
If you are interested in seeing the incredible work that's happening in local newsrooms throughout the country, there's a newsletter that's called Local Matters. And it's a free newsletter, and it's weekly, and they share incredible investigative work that's happening throughout the country. And um, you know, there is incredible work happening all over the country. What I do now is national investigation, so I don't have that same local tie any longer, but there's still just amazing work happening by journalists throughout the US. Thanks for your question. Hi there. I want to thank you guys again uh, for coming and speaking to everyone. You talked a lot about trust in the media and fatigue with different types of news. As investi investigative journalists, why is it important to continue what you do and what drives you into continue, even though you yourselves might get fatigue and feel a little bit burdened by that lack of trust or uh, people saying they're a little tired of news such as this? I think what keeps me going is the the hope that we're going to make a difference. And, you know, we write about really difficult topics all the time. And I think what drives me is the hope that it will be better because of the work that we're doing, but also doing right by the people who are trusting us. Because people are trusting us in some cases with the worst moments of their lives. And I feel an obligation and a commitment to do right by the trust that they're placing in me. And, and that keeps me going when these are really tough topics. And it, it takes a special kind of crazy to do this. And, you know, somebody who's driven, somebody who likes to solve a puzzle, you know, the, 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 the challenge when, when somebody says no, I want to say why, and then I'm going to have them explain why, why. And, you know, so there's, there's that kind of drive. And then again, you know, there's an adrenaline buzz to it when you're moving through that and you're so deep into it. Um, but it's, it, 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 at the end, you know, those, those small successes, somebody saying thank you, you know, you made a difference in my life. You know, if it, any of you, if you could have somebody come up to you and say, you made a difference in my life, that, that's a, a big deal. And, you know, you can't ask for a better reward than that. And if you can make a difference in a bunch of people's lives, you know. So you're, you're always trying to, you know, in some ways, like, I guess, you know, you're looking for that next high of trying to help people and, and do the right thing and, and be the voice for people who don't have a voice. So a big part of this story was the Maggie Nichols sideline or side part of it and going to the FBI and the criminal um, charges and case. Once one of your stories gets to criminal charges, either federally or state level, how does that change your process? How does that change your ability to really do that fact checking? Um, just what does that look like once the criminal side intersects with what you're reporting? Well, I think, first of all, Tim talked about this a little bit earlier. You know, as journalists, we are often looking for documentation to verify information that we've received. And so, you know, in the case of Larry Nassar, as an example, being able to see copies of reports and confirm information that we had heard directly from survivors was helpful to ensuring the accuracy of information that we had and verifying other facts through that process. Um, but it doesn't really change. The threshold for accuracy and, and fairness and all of that don't change, although documents are always helpful. In fact, any investigation that we're doing, we're asking ourselves, what records might be available? Where might I be able to get copies of those records? And they're both the traditional sorts of records that you think about, the court records, the police records, but also sometimes it might be someone trusting us with their counseling records or their medical records, or their diary that they'd written at the time. There's a lot of different ways that people might share information to help us in the course of, of the work that we're doing, and it's because they believe in the why behind what we're doing. Um, we talked about you know, interviewing survivors a little bit earlier, but you know, 
we try to over communicate and explain we don't want to just talk to you to hear what you have to say but we want to be very clear about why we want you to share this information and it's because we want to help the public understand what's going on here and we explain kind of the why behind questions we ask to help people understand it yeah, and then just real quickly i promise um you know we're always looking for paper and the, those records that verify what we're doing. But the other end, sometimes in those kind of cases, people are, once there's a criminal case, they become, they can't talk or they're restricted to what they can say. So there's also some negative to that, but the, the, the positive options outweigh it. But again, some people are, are shut down by their attorneys or by the law enforcement. I do wanna just add one thing that I think is important to understand, which is, just because it appears in an official record doesn't mean that it's right either. Um, you know, and, and so we're, we're pulling lots of sources of information as we're doing our work because think about records just like people, right? Um, maybe somebody was typing fast and they typed the wrong fact. Or, you know, th there have been plenty of times in the work that we've done where there's a police record where almost everything is completely accurate, but there are slight details that are wrong and it's just a typing error. And we're able to verify that through other means. So it, it's not infallible, but it, all of that information is helpful for us in being able to do the work that we do. I think we have one more from Rhonda, is that correct? Go ahead, Rhonda. You spoke about the new law that uh, requires that everybody report. How is that different from what law, this is a two-part question, how is that different from the law prior to the new law? And the second part is, um, I know that Mr. Penny lost his job, um, and it might have been covered in the video and I missed it, but have charges been brought forward uh, on him? So Steve Penny, uh, last I checked, which was uh, the middle of last year, was still facing uh, charges of tampering with evidence. So he has faced criminal charges in Texas, or a criminal charge, I should say, in Texas. Um, and that case was still pending. Um, and then in terms of the changes to the law, so Every state has a slightly different child abuse mandatory reporting law, and in some states, it's Indiana, as an example, is a universal mandatory reporting state. So regardless of what title you have or what job you have, if you have reason to believe a child is being abused or neglected, you have an obligation to report it to authorities. Not every state is like that. There are states that that obligation is only for teachers or it's only for particular individuals. And that was one of the things that USA Gymnastics argued is they argued that they had no obligation to report in certain states because they were an institution, not an individual. And they also argued that because of the type of person that it was that they weren't covered under the child abuse mandatory reporting law. So what the federal law does is it says, we don't care what state you're in, you have an obligation to report this immediately to authorities. And it reiterates that this means you, sports <laughs> organizations. Yeah. All right. I think that pretty much concludes the question and answer session. I, again, I very much appreciate Marissa and Tim coming to speak and share their experiences with us today. And I greatly appreciate all the students, faculty, staff, and others uh, who came to attend this program this evening. Thank you. Thank you all. Yeah, thank you for coming. We appreciate it.